right, welcome everyone to our second annual Supernatural Healthcare Symposium. This event represents a significant body of efforts and work from our esteemed, thank you for getting that joke, I appreciate that. There'll be some subtle jokes throughout the way, so you will have to laugh, um, of work of, with just our amazing faculty that we have here. Um, and one of, the th uh, one of the exciting things about this event is that it allows our, our faculty to become fully human. There's another joke. Ah. But uh, yeah, thank you, exactly. But they, yeah, they have lives, they have senses of humor, uh, and it's clear that they all love what they do. So we are thrilled to be able to celebrate the supernatural and uh, the Halloween Day of the Dead spirit at the same time um, and showcase our exciting things. So Dr. Sharon Gorman and Dr. Craig Elliott, welcome. We don't, we don't bite, so feel free to move up to the front. Ah, more good humor. <laughs> or not. Or, yes. So we're excited to talk a little bit about bioethics and make it a little more interesting and harrowing than maybe you're used to. Um, we're going to really delve into what happens if you show up on a disaster relief mission and suddenly you realize there's something like a horde of zombies there. What are you, do your ethical duties change? Can you can you kill the zombies? You're a healthcare provider. What what does bioethics have to say about that? Or what if you show up and there's a bunch of vampires or demons? You know, it's like Buffy the Vampire Slayer all over again. Right. What kind of role do you play if you thought you were there to deliver healthcare and you find yourself with hordes of demons? So you know, we got to start at the beginning. Right. So, and again, um, for those of us who are old enough for, to remember the Family Circle cartoons, <laughs> there you go, exactly. <laughs> but updated and modernized, right? They didn't have uh, zombies back in the, uh, or the same kind of zombies that they had back in the day with, uh, in the Family Circus family. Um, so, you know, what is a disaster? We're going to start with, with that because that sets the context for our healthcare interventions. Um, so, de defined by the WMA, a disaster is a sudden occurrence of calamitous usually violent, uh, event re resulting in substantial material damage, uh, displacement of people, and a large number of victims and social disruption. So here are so some examples. This begs the question, would a vampire invasion or a horde of zombies actually be a disaster? And if you use that definition of disaster, I think we could all agree that those things could all happen in any one of these kind of supernatural demon-related events. And that, that would be a disaster. So yes, these kinds of events do qualify for disaster. Right. And our research shows this. <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> YouTube agrees with us. <laughs> so that leads us to the next kind of bullet point. Disasters and medical care during disasters, you have to use the concept of triage for treating patients. Right, right. Because with limited time, limited resources, limited uh, personnel, you can't heal everybody. And so we want to be able to talk um, about what our approach and planning approaching a, a calamitous situation would be and how we make sure that we have good plans in place to be able to support us and have the maximum benefit possible. And I think we need to realize in this definition from the World Medical Association that health is probably a little bit broader than we uh, anticipate <laughs> and can include, include things like death or suspended animation. That their definition of health probably didn't go that far, but if we reach it a little bit farther, triage is still an appropriate kind of technique to use exactly. for what are you going to do in this disaster as the healthcare provider. So there are 
prioritization guidelines really kind of put people into these three big categories. People who need urgent care, people who need care, but they can probably wait because there's a disaster. And then there is a group where it is totally ethically accepted based on the situation that providing no care is completely understandable. Um, it's using too many resources, the injuries are extreme, people might not be able to be saved because of circumstances, maybe we have surgical techniques but it would take eight or nine hours and how many other people could that surgeon be helping in the eight or nine hours for that one surgery. And so out of our research we are, provising, uh, we are proposing revised <laughs> guidelines for a prioritization and so we add the uh, one down here, destroy. <laughs> Um, that there may be somebody that, you know, that's beyond that no care idea um, that really needs to be taken out. Um, and, so, and so we categorize those people as, you know, A, consumes resources and people, <laughs> bites back, um, and we, we assess cannot be returned to the living. And so we want to be able to have this in, for our next medical mission that we take to Panama. Because <laughs> um, you never know got to be ready. So adding this category we think fits with the guidelines that we've already discussed. Because really what you're looking at is the destroy category is just an extension of beyond emergency care and people who are not going to be benefiting. Again, we've got to we have scarce resources. There's only so many people left. We might need to get rid of some of the zombies, right? Um, maybe it's also scarce resources in that we only have so many cutting implements and some of them should be allocated for destruction. Yes. There's only so many scalpels and maybe some of them should be turned into tools to help defeat zombies. Um, you should not consider if you have to go into that destroy category as any kind of failure. Okay, It's justified. You're saving other survivors. So you're actually providing care to the survivors. And again, this doesn't mean that you can't show compassion and respect. So the model for the compassion and respect in your relation to patients during disaster relates to only evaluating them based on their medical status. So you don't hate the zombies and want to kill them because they're awful non-people. It's because they're zombies and their medical status puts them in that undead category. Um, you're going to show survivors respect. In this case, if you're killing the zombies, you're showing the survivors the utmost kind of respect because you're actually helping to protect them. Um, you get consent when it's possible. A zombie, as Dr. Barb Puder talked about last year, really doesn't have higher levels of mental function, so we really say that you don't have to get the zombie's consent for anything. Um, <laughs> And then last of all, you need to respect local customs. And this could have to do with something like a bunch of vampires. Maybe some of your patients want to wear garlic around their necks. You shouldn't be taking that off while you're providing care. But respect their culture and their understanding of how to protect themselves in this certain instance and let them wear that. Let somebody carry their machete because maybe the zombie will come into the emergency department and they might have to kill it. So there is a whole uh, body of literature about bioethics in relationship to zombies. Uh, and so Johns Hopkins actually is leading the way with the biomedical approach in all seriousness. Um, so it, we've just taken, they've got uh, 15 or so bioethical considerations um, that you need to consider. So here's just a couple of them. So again, building on the idea of community engagement is very important to all disaster planning. Anyone who becomes a zombie automatically loses their right to participate in <laughs> the town hall forums. And so uh, the plans are grounded in democratic process and consultation and review. Um, it is perfectly acceptable to do this in a fleeing armored van <laughs> while you're fleeing a horde and trying to make some other provisions. Um, disaster plans should take into account the innate, innate, innate inalienable right of all citizens uh, until they get bitten. <laughs> and then you can totally death panel them. So, <laughs> And then preparedness plans must seek to fairly distribute resources. And again, this may often include uh, guns and other weapons. Make sure that you are uh, distributing those resources while you're fighting your way out of Bass Pro in a zombie infested mall. Um, one of the ones they also talk about, they spend, uh, Johns Hopkins spends a considerable amount of time talking about do you need informed consent with zombies and they say no because uh, they, they have a whole qualification matrix that talks about the higher level response that um, informed consent requires uh, being alive and that zombies don't meet that standard um, and so therefore you are free to do with them as you will and not jeopardize any professional standing that you have in your professional organizations.
And again, recognize that you don't have just responsibility and disasters to the patients who maybe you might consider the zombies as patients, but they're really not your patients. You might have bigger responsibilities to society. Um, and there is also the responsibility to yourself. You are allowed to keep yourself healthy. And if that means killing a zombie that's coming to bite you, you are totally allowed to do that. Um, the disaster literature actually recognizes that, you know, you might have to back up and there might be unacceptable limits. And I'm going to stop providing health care at the zombie infested hospital and move on down the street to the strip mall that hasn't been invaded yet. And that's okay. So in summary, yes. Oh, okay. I was gonna say this is so. Uh, this takes us back. This is uh, for all the Duran Duran people, fans, and the, the. This is a Duran Duran video <laughs> from back in our day. Um, so Dr. Gorman and I were reliving our own initial uh, attraction to zombies and the invasion possibilities there. And when you look like Duran Duran, it is possible to escape a zombie situation without harm. So in summary, we'd like to let you all know that bioethical principles during disaster relief will let you kill zombies, will let you stab vampires, will let you cut off the heads of demons, and that you should be empowered, that you have ethical reasons that you can do that. Exactly. Thank you very much. Here, Here are reference. the references. Thank you very much. Excellent work. Thank you. Well done. And so next... Up, we have Dr. Kira Cox. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, hard act to follow. So um, I'm Kira Cox, and I'm on the faculty of the OT department here at Samuel Merritt, and I'm here to talk to you about service dogs of the apocalypse. Um, luckily, we have a variety of highly trained dogs that can help us in various situations if the apocalypse happens. Uh, for example, the U.S. military uses dogs in combat zones. They, they train them in, they use them for patrol, retrieval, uh, detection, and tracking. Uh, here's one of the most famous uh, military dogs, it's Cairo. He actually was on the team that captured bin Laden, and he uh, served in Afghanistan from for three human years are 21 dog years. <laughs> um, there's another branch of the military you might not know about. It's the Combat Operational, Operational Stress Control Unit. And uh, therapy dogs are part of the occupational therapy team that gets deployed in these units. And uh, they're used uh, if there's a critical incident. They're sent in 48 to 72 hours after a critical incident, such as a soldier being killed. And they provide emotional support and stress relief to the troops. Um, we also have search and rescue dogs and search and recovery dogs. Search and rescue dogs are trained to find living people. Search and recovery dogs are, are trained to find cadavers. And uh, so possibly in the apocalypse, we can cross train them to help us identify the undead, especially <laughs> if they're showing up at your town hall meetings. Um, so therapy dogs, this is another type of dog that uh, serves us. This happens to be my little guy. And um, I've been using therapy dogs and occupational therapy for over 20 years, and uh, they make me a much better therapist. But uh, they, not only therapists use them, volunteers use therapy dogs to, to do a variety of, of things for us. Um, here he is uh, with somebody who had a stroke. And then there's emotional support animals. And uh, an emotional support animal can be any animal. And, um, they are, uh, accommodations are made in two federal acts for them, so the Air Carriers Access Act and the Fair Housing Act. So if you need an emotional support animal and you have documentation of that from a healthcare provider, you can fly on an airplane with your animal, as long as it's not a snake, they don't let snakes, uh, and have the fee for animals waived on the flight. Also in the Fair Housing Act, uh, if the, your housing has a no pets policy with documentation, you may be able to have your emotional support animal live with you. And also the California Fair Employment and Housing Act has accommodations for emotional support animals also. So we've been talking a lot about uh, animals that service in, in different ways. And now I want to talk about service animals as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So they have a very clear definition of service animals. And, and those service animals uh, 
uh, people with disabilities with these type of service animals are allowed access to all public places. So the definition from the ADA for a service animal is that it's a dog, so it has to be a dog, and that they are trained to perform tasks for a person with a, with a disability. So they have to perform tasks that are related to the person's disability um, and be trained for that person. Um, this is probably a type of service animal that you've seen, a guide dog for the blind uh, fulfills the ADA uh, criteria. Also, a hearing assistance dog, so people of, who can't hear, the dog will alert them to people or the phone ringing or the doorbell or danger uh, involving sound. Uh, there's a lot of other types of service animals. They can smell when somebody's blood glucose level is changing and alert them to that fact. They can alert people before they have a seizure, when a seizure is in, imminent, so they can get to a safe place. Uh, they're used to uh, either interrupt or actually stop the person from doing destructive behaviors. And then they do all sorts of things like retrieve items, pick things up off the floor, open the fridge and bring you a can of soda. Uh, they also can be used as balance assistants. So, um, and in fact, one of the, at least one of the dogs that has been deployed as a combat uh, stress control dog uh, when they came back stateside, it was trained a, by a PT to be a balance dog for a veteran. Um, and a lot of the combat stress control dogs, actually, their second life is as a service dog for veterans. Um, so I told you that the ADA says that a service animal is only a dog, and that's true. However, they also provide accommodations to people with disabilities who use miniature horses. And uh, the, the advantage of miniature horses is if you have a health or religious reason why you can't use a dog as a, uh, for assistance, you can use a horse. And then the other advantage is that they live two to three times longer than a dog. Um, but obviously there are other things. They can be house trained, uh, but they need more space and they eat hay rather than kibble. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of, but they're cute, which is the important thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so in the apocalypse, uh, there, there are probably going to be some d zombies with, um, with documented disability. And uh, <laughs> unlike Dr. Gorman and Dr. Elliot, I propose living in harmony with the zombies. And, um, and so, you know, we really need to respect their rights. So they might uh, have service dogs. And I did a quick... Uh, uh, review of the internet looking for tasks that service dogs do for zombies and it seems to be mainly <laughs> seems to be mainly limb retrieval uh, mainly mainly hands actually but yeah oh also kind of on an interesting note if you want a dog in the apocalypse and you want to make sure that it doesn't turn into a zombie Smaller dogs are better because zombies have a really hard time bending over. <laughs> so if you, ha if you have a dog that's less than 16 inches high at the shoulder, it's got a much better chance of not being bitten by a zombie. Yeah. Okay, so the ADA allows uh, service animals to be in public places, but so what do you do if a zombie wants to bring his dog into your business and you're kind of not sure if it's a service dog or not? and you have a no pets policy. So by law, you may ask them if their dog is required due to a disability. And you may ask them what tasks that the dog has been trained to do for the zombie. But by law, you may not ask for service uh, animal documentation. And you cannot ask the zombie about what disability they have. <laughs> and you also can't ask them to demonstrate the task that the dog is trained to do. Uh, asking those additional questions or refusing access uh, is a crime and has very severe federal fines, $55,000, or up to $55,000 for the first violation, and it can go up to $100,000 for a second. And then on top of that, it's a misdemeanor in California, and you can get another $2,500 fine. So it's a little, it can be a little difficult for business owners when people are bringing dogs in, and unfortunately, people are bringing dogs in and saying they're service animals when they're not people. So again, the ADA definition of a service animal is very strict. Dog performing tasks related to the disability. Um, 
And so I wanted to let people know that falsely identifying your dog as a service dog um, if it, it is, can be punished by jail and or a fine. So just keep that in mind. If I mean, I'd love to bring Cree with me everywhere, but um, that's, uh, I, we don't want to take away from the job the service dogs do. And yeah, these are great resources if you want to know more about it. Here's some photo credits and happy Halloween. <laughs> And again, you are getting the wide variety of uh, opinions on how to work with, uh, with zombies. Um, there you go. All good. So this should inform the rest of your semester's worth of work <laughs> as far as where to find on that. We don't want to present one approach. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Mike Negretti uh, talking with us on Team Steps. Who has done Team Steps in the, uh, in the audience? Excellent. So, um, you know, it's important that we uh, bring our team steps uh, training to the supernatural. Welcome, welcome. My name is Dracula. Thank you for coming to my meeting. You may be wondering why you're here. Let me ask you a question. Who likes to eat people? Ah! Yes, yes, that's what I thought. And who would like to eat more people? Ah! Yes, yes, my thoughts exactly. I thought that by working as a team, we could do more and we could eat more people together. That is why I invited an expert to come speak with us tonight about Team Steps. Without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Emil for all. Oh, oh settle down. Yes, yes, yes. No, wait, 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 not yet. I promised we would not eat our speaker until after the presentation. Besides, if we eat her now, how can we learn? Welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Dracula. Um, I think, anyways. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about Team Steps. And Team Steps is a specific framework for communication that helps you work better as a team in order to be syn synchronous and in sync, right? Okay, so there are three things that we're going to talk about today in regards to Team Steps. And we want to integrate you as a team today, so that, that's our plan. We're going to attack Three, oh, okay. no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, we're going to talk about three specific strategies to do that, all right? Okay, so let's get started. So the first thing we'll talk about is closed loop communication. Um, no talking back there, okay? Okay, closed loop communication, all right? Um, so the first thing we want to discuss is the request. When you request something, um, you want to make sure that you say the person's name, right? You make eye contact with that person, and ideally you would point at that person, okay? Oh, no, no, you sit down, all right? We're not requesting yet, okay? Okay, sit down, thank you. Now that we understand the request tool, we can uh, move on to the cross-check. And the cross-check is when the request is made, the other team member will then repeat back what the request is and say, either I've got it, or can you explain more, please? So it's an opportunity for your team to clarify what that request was, right? Great. The, okay. All right, so the next tool is the check back, okay? And um, the check back is when the request has been completed, your team member will then say, hello, your request has been completed. So let's say, um, oh, I, um, hey, Dracula, will you kill that person? Dra oh, I know, yeah, okay. Love your sense of humor. Um, then Dracula will say, uh, or will say, 
I will kill that person. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's like a lot of snacks in a moment. They're hungry for knowledge. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so then <laughs> Dracula um, uh, will say, once he is done killing that person, he'll say, I have killed that person. You may eat now, right? He'll say, dinner is ready. <laughs> Something like that. So sit down, sit down. We'll have snacks in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. All right. So. There we have the request. We've moved through the whole closed loop communication. We've, we've done the request, right? The cross check, which is an opportunity for clarification. And then the check back, when the request has been fulfilled, your team member will then confirm that that request has been fulfilled, right? And we call that closed loop communication. And this is an opportunity for um, more efficient teamwork. So I hope you were taking notes. Oh, except you, mummy. <laughs> right, you're tied up. Okay. Um, yeah. So who can give me any real life examples of closed loop communication? Oh, oh, me, me. Go ahead, Dracula. Every evening when I wake up and leave the coffin, I go straight to Blood Bucks and order my grande O negative. Scappuccino with extra scabs. The zombie who's taking my order repeats back while she writes my name on the cup. That's a cross check, right? That's right. Yes. 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 And then what happens when your order is completed? Well, then the zombie at the end of the counter put makes it and puts it down saying, Grande O negative scappuccino with extra scabs for Dracula. That's a check back, right? That's right. And yes, so with all of that together, that's closed loop communication. <sighs> now that we've gotten this far, I think it's time for a little exercise. So, what yes. we're going to do is we're going to take 60 seconds and your team is going to build the tallest Duplo tower. And these are Duplos, okay? And the, the Duplos are right behind you for you to use. So in this exercise, we have one team leader, and that will be Dracula. Here you go, no. Dracula. Thank you. So these are the instructions. Dracula, do not let the other members of your team see those. Back, 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 back. Dracula has the instructions, and Dracula is only allowed to read the instructions, okay? And you all need to follow it. And then the rest of you will follow the instructions, and some of you will be builders, and some of you will be runners. Runners can only take five Duplos at a time. Builders can only build, okay? Um, and then at the end of 60 seconds, there can be no Duplos on the table, okay? And we're trying to build the tallest tower, remember? Okay. Just pretend like it's a person, no. okay? Great. Um, wonderful. And remember, the purpose of this exercise is to remember, is to try and use our closed loop communication um, tools and strategies, all right? Ready? Begin. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go, everybody up. Everybody up. Okay, you are a runner, you are a builder. You, go get me a red block. Wait, wait, you didn't repeat back to me. Go get me a red block. Oh, you flesh-eating fool, this will not work. You and this boy, go get me a red block. Got it, I'm getting you a red block. Well, what are you waiting for? Why? Oh, forget it! Let's go eat the speaker! Yes! Oh, oh. Wait for me! Oh, she's so delicious! <laughs> Come on, zombie! Sadly, I went in all in sober, so. All right, so next up is Dr. Drew Smith, Dr. Stephen Hill, talking to us about the terrestrially challenged. So where, 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 where is it? Where is Well, it's uh, great to be back. 
Well, really, it's great to be anywhere. So, but uh, we've had a very uh, unusual year since last year, um, and previously, for those of you that weren't here last year, we had uh, a particularly curious case of patient ES, a possible diagnosis of Luna zombiesis, or in layman's terms, uh, she was a crazy zombie. Uh, and just in case you don't recall that. Uh, we can give you the highlights of what seemed to be, for some reason, this was the last time she actually came to the mark. Uh, she had, uh, she really was literally falling to pieces. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. We didn't see her again, but uh, word must have gotten out at the wonderful analyses we were able to do with her. And as a result, we saw an unusual uh, number of unusual referrals and it increased uh, dramatically to the point where I came to the conclusion that really uh, the, the lab itself needed more expertise in this uh, in this particular area and specifically I really felt that we were seeing a lot of uh, what I would call supernatural referrals uh, and that was certainly beyond uh, the scope of my training so we uh, initiated a global search for a supernatural biomechanics expert. And um, at, I just happened to come across this LinkedIn page. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to my great surprise, I found that Dr. Stephen Hill was not only available and willing to come to Northern California from the uh, cold climes of Canada, uh, but he was a biomechanist specializing in supernatural biomechanics, including but not limited to <laughs> zombies, ghouls, goats, walking dead, sleep deprived, and underfed undergraduates. <laughs> uh, so really, I think I should let uh, Dr. Hill, Steve, take over here because uh, he has an, a few very interesting cases he'd like to share with you. Uh, thank you, Drew. And thank you to Samuel Merritt University for welcoming me here to uh, to pursue my, my research in this curiosity, well, morbid curiosity-based research that I tend to do. It wasn't as well received as I might have expected um, by the researchers at Toronto Rehab, but, um, you know, when I announced I was leaving, they gave me a big send-off, and, you know, it really, even the townspeople showed up for a, for a big go-away party, and then encouraged me to pursue uh, other arenas, yes. So I'll, I'll sort of present to you a few different cases that came up. So first of all, it was a student here, actually, who, uh, when he went out into the hallway um, between classes, felt his legs being pulled up in the air by some unseen forces. So we've termed it conditional inversion reaction complex unexplained syndrome. <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful, so we're kind of, kind of come up with a convenient acronym for it. So anyway, <laughs> C-I-R... C-U-S. So, anyway, so here's, a, here's the video. So he was able to reproduce the phenomenon in our, in our lab so we could measure it with our instruments. <laughs> the next is a, actually a community uh, athlete who contacted the lab. He wanted to do a running analysis, which we can do with a new marker set on the treadmill. Um, uh, he's a trail runner, uh, has a, a really demanding job in the city, and so he's only, only able to run at night in the East Bay Forest areas. Um, I, I discouraged him with the idea because, you know, the importance of vision in, in controlling, uh, giving you uh, safe mobility in a cluttered environment like running through the woods. Uh, but he ensured me he had very good night vision. Um, also, the, the World Health Organization is now discouraging us for, from consuming processed meats, but he assured me that he likes to eat just fresh meat. <laughs> Um, I asked him if he'd been able to fit in the six small meals a day that we had recommended, but he says he's so busy during the day, he can only fit in, you know, he's, he's, he just can't get a bite to eat during the day, and then by nightfall, he's just ravenous. <laughs> anyway, this is him before. And there, as his program progressed, there's been a coincidental kind of increase in uh, local area reports of predatory activity in the woods. <laughs> Now we're, we're seeing, so when we had him come back, he, he called, he wanted to reschedule for the evening because he's working so late. Um, so Drew and I took a break and went for dinner. When we were on walking back to the lab, well, it, it was surprising. We could actually see quite well because it was a full moon. 
when he arrived in the lab, we noticed that this major muscle, you know, hypertrophy, um, increased body hair and even hair in his face, some swelling in his, f so he had almost like a snout. You know? And his <laughs> sort of teeth protrusions, especially the canine teeth. And instead of the regular talkative guy we had, he was using his loud vocalizations, kind of growling, and he's adopted this quadruped running style. <laughs> so there he is. It seems to work for him with the low-lying branches. <laughs> and lastly, uh, we have uh, one of the students here, a uh, healthy adult healthcare professional. She went into podiatry specifically because she's always wanted to help people. So she has an exceptional gait pattern, effortlessly walking across over and over as we quite often have to do. Hundreds of walking trials. I'll just show you a few. No discernible abnormalities. Uh, later on as the study continued, she also expressed a, a yen to do more with her special abilities to serve the community, which I think was in keeping with the general theme at the university for community outreach. Uh, unfortunately, the experiment ended abruptly when I think she must have heard something. It was like she heard help or something. I'm not sure what it was, but she had to leave abruptly. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to see her back in the lab um, because she was still wearing electrodes. We'd like to get those back, and we'd like to see her again. So thank you very much. <laughs> And we'd like to take this opportunity to plug our conference, which is next week, <laughs> Motion Analysis in, Inter in Interdisciplinary Healthcare, Friday and Saturday, November 6th and 7th. Thank you. Where you will be able to see more of that kind of uh, analysis, I would expect. All right. Are you ready for this? Oh, yeah, it's, it's Mike, so it's, uh, we have to ask. It's part of the informed consent. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Michael DeRosa talking about do vampires suck or not? So we're going to go forward. Thank you. Uh, I, too, am grateful to be back. Didn't think that would happen after last year's presentation. Uh, but we're here to debunk some myth and, and uh, probably stir up some controversy. Uh, but the premise of our presentation today is that vampires don't suck. And our subtitle is The Undead and Anticoagulation. So our purpose is that culturally competent healthcare demands that we practice free from biased and, and unfounded stereotypes. Uh, myths about undead perpetuate those stereotypes and limit our ability to provide competent care to undead patients. Lack of competent care results in less use of medical resources and, and obviously less compliance, so it's important to get past stereotypes in order to provide more effective care. And the, the stereotype that vampires actually suck blood um, it goes back in our literature and our art and, and our movies for easily 100 years. So this is D.H. Lawrence talking about people as emotional vampires who suck the life out of a being. Of course, many of us remember the sort of prototypical vampire presentation of Bela Lugosi. I am Dracula. Oh, it's, it's he, really I think, just soiled himself. To see you. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the driver and my luggage and, well, and with all this, I, I thought I was in the wrong place. I bid you welcome. So basically what we got from him was A the accent. 3,000-year-old vampire wants to suck my blood. Must be Thursday. And from Buffy, the, the, present, the perpetuation of the suck myth. Um, but in fact, Bela Lugosi never said the word suck in that movie. And, uh, well, here's the one. I want to suck your blood! I want to suck your blood! I want to And if you can listen to this for 30 seconds without actually wanting to kill want someone to yourself, suck your blood. maybe you belong in our lab. Um, but what we know is, in reality, the, the common phrase, I want to suck your blood, borrows Lugosi's accent, but, but the, the, the word was never actually used in that movie. It appears nowhere in the script. And the idea that Dracula imbibes by sucking blood is actually probably not true. Uh, for this purpose, we actually have a really viable animal model in the vampire bat. 
We know that the vampire bat contains in its saliva an enzyme that has been called draculin and studied and actually gained FDA approval um, as a clot buster. And it's actually in some ways more effective. It's safer. It's safe to be used up to nine hours after the onset of a stroke when uh, the TPA that's standardly used is a, has a three or four hour window before it starts to cause damage. And what we know about draculin is in the lower right hand corner you see the um, coagulation cascade. We're dealing probably with the right-hand side of that cascade, which is called the extrinsic pathway, because it begins with external damage to the vasculature, which as you can imagine a vampire bite might be, and the stimulation and activation of factor 7, which activates factor 10. Factor 10 is the entry point to the final common pathway of coagulation, where both, where, where both pathways lead to in order to form a fibrin-based clot. We know about draculin is that that's also the point where draculin works. It's actually an active inhibitor and non-competitive inhibitor of factor 10 and inhibits coagulation. So the vampire bat actually doesn't have to suck anything. It just has to induce the bite and let the blood simply flow into its throat where it can imbibe that blood meal. Here it is biting on a heel, a cow or a horse or something. Later in the video you see it move up, induce the wound. The vampire bat has no front teeth and it has a grooved tongue, making it easier for this anticoagulated blood to simply flow into its abdomen. So using this animal model, we propose that the vampire, the humanoid vampire, doesn't suck either. It actually probably has a similar kind of enzyme. And so we thought, the CDC even has a web page dedicated to vampire nutrition, so obviously there's, there's research money in this area. So we thought, from an evolutionary standpoint, what are the advantages of deglutition over actually sucking? And we figured... Um, it's, it's simpler and easier to maintain one complex neuromuscular function than two. Um, there, that there's a conservation of energy piece that ingurgitation actually requires very little in the, in the way of energy. It's a very passive process. And so you need, and you also need less metabolic machinery. And we know that the vampire bat drinks blood because it has very little ability in its abdomen to process a, a, another kind of meal, a complex, more complex meal. So. Do humanoid vampires, the undead, benefit from a, a similar model? We're ready to go on this. We're ready to, to study this. We just need one. Um, <laughs> and so we've been on the search. Like I said, the lab is up and running, and, it, and, and, it, and it's ready to go right here on Summit Avenue. Um, we've got the simulators in place. Um, we can pump blood through these, and, and they actually bleed and, and, and so on. Uh, we just need to find a viable candidate. Um, we're looking far and wide for a humanoid, soul-sucking, blood-drinking <laughs> test subject um, that we might be able to um, take to the lab and figure out whether or not vampires suck. Thank you very much. All right, so without further ado, Elisa Laird Metke, uh, Metke our D Director of Disability Services, about creating inclusive environments. Hi, everyone. So I'm the Director of Disability Services for students here at Samuel Merritt, and I have some really important disability-related information today that I think is crucial for all of us to hear. As we all know, our world is co populated almost completely by superheroes. Um, and. Uh, it doesn't matter if you live in New York, Metropolis, Gotham, Springfield, our world is, is almost exclusively superheroes. Those superheroes can do a lot of things that we, those who don't have superpowers, who I think are uh, largely in this room, uh, can't do. So they can leap tall buildings in a single bound, they have superhuman strength, they have laser vision, they even outdo us in sports. <laughs> And even day-to-day -day tasks are a problem, uh, are, are easier for them to do than it is for us to do. This makes us essentially disabled as compared to the vast majority of our peers who have superpowers. 
So what does this mean for our daily lives? Well, for one thing, our environment is, an, is a barrier to us as people who don't have superpowers. So um, as we know, elevators are essentially obsolete. There's cars are barely around these days because almost the entire population can get around by leaping across buildings, uh, running at super fast speeds. There's no more Amtrak. Uh, and there's no more air travel, uh, commercial air travel. Uh, because it's just not necessary for the majority of the population, and that, of course, puts us at a distinct disadvantage. Um, so you may have heard of disability accommodations, and uh, those are modifications to policies or the provision of auxiliary aids and services. And those are things that we, the uh, non-super ability uh, folks, can use to our advantage. Uh, and the goal of those is to put us on the level playing field with the superheroes. We know of at least one person who's taken advantage of those. Uh, so this is someone who does not have any superpowers, but has, through the use of auxiliary aids and services, managed to put himself on the level of the superheroes. Uh, here's another example. <laughs> Iron Man also, no innate superpowers, yet he is able to uh, th use auxiliary aids to uh, put himself at that level. But what do those folks have that, that the majority of us don't have? Well, they are, are men of means. I don't know about you all, I can't afford a Batmobile. I uh, drive a Honda. <laughs> <laughs> so other barriers are, are uh, presented to us in the educational environment. So when we look at Superman, for example, um, and this is a little tough to read, uh, but he's using super mathematics. One bean weighs one twentieth of an ounce. The, car weigh, the jar weighs 12 pounds, allowing two pounds for the jar. That makes 20 times 6 times 10 or 32,000 beans. Next request, please. He's a little show-offy. Uh, but what he's doing there is super mathematics. This is mathematics that I think all of us could do, given enough time. If we had a little bit of extra time on the exam, we too <laughs> could complete this kind of mathematical process. It's not super advanced, but we can't go as fast as Superman. Similarly, in the classroom, uh, this is the flash, uh, and he says that he can think at the speed of light, perceive events that last for less than an out of second, and there at the end he says he sees everything and everyone. Well, I can only attend to one thing at a time when I'm in a classroom setting, and so that puts me at a distinct disadvantage as compared to the flash, and I think a lot of you all can relate to that. So. Uh, Disability accommodations are, are available, and that's one thing that we can use uh, so that we can keep up with our superhero peers and graduate and go on to successful careers as they have. Uh, but another option is universal design. So universal design is, uh, as, as put by the North Carolina State Center for Universal Design, uh, intended to simplify life for everyone by making products, communications, and the built environment more usable by as many people as possible at little or no extra cost. Uh, and it benefits people of all ages and abilities. And so you can see that inclusion is the major theme of universal design. It's meant to be benefit everyone, disabled and not. So I have lost my animations, so these aren't going to come up one at a time. But um, they, uh, the red are uh, different ways that in the classroom we might be able to get uh, information in different ways. So whether it's visually via slides or via um, papers that we have in front of us, uh, or whether it's uh, auditorily as well with somebody giving a lecture, maybe there's some group work going on, we're exchanging ideas. Each of us works in different modalities and, are, and learn best in different ways. So if information is presented in all these ways, then we're all on a much more level playing field. And then similarly, when it's time to demonstrate that we've mastered the material, um, there are a multitude of ways that that could be done. So maybe there's a group project, and, and that's how students have an option to show that they've learned the material, or an individual presentation, or something individual like uh, an exam, or like a paper to show that they have learned uh, the material. If students have a choice and can do any of these, then they are uh, not limited by any uh, disability because they, uh, can choose the modality that works best for them, and it basically eliminates the need for disability accommodations in the classroom. So again, universal design is meant to benefit everyone, and it benefits superheroes too, not just uh, those of us without superpowers. So let me just show you a couple examples of that. Uh, the Flash gives a terrible oral presentation. <laughs> he just talks too fast. 
but he's really great at writing papers and taking exams on his own. Similarly, uh, the Hulk, um, Bruce Banner, uh, doesn't work well with groups because he keeps turning all green when he has to deal with that guy. And I think we can all relate. So there's an example uh, right here at Samuel Merritt of uh, a great example of this is census access. So um, this is a way that you can get your books in auditory form uh, as well as visual. You may already have it in visual. Uh, this is available to everyone at most campuses. This is available only through the Disability Services Office and only for students who need it for an accommodation here at Samuel Merritt. It's available to everyone. We also run into physical barriers uh, as non-superheroes. So I'm just going to show you a couple examples of this before I wrap up. Oh, no, my slide disappeared. Um, OK, we'll skip that one. So. Um, BART turnstiles can benefit uh, people who uh, use wheelchairs as well as people of all different body types. Uh, playground structures with ramps allow kids who can't climb to get to the top of the stairs, just like the other kids. Uh, that surface, with it's not wood chips or sand, means that wheelchairs can roll on it. And Spider-Man loves it because it's nice and cushy and makes for a good landing as he's practicing maneuvers. And so uh, my conclusion is that I. Um, have found that all of these students have benefited from universal design and have gone on to be successful since their careers at Samuel Merritt, and I expect that you all will too. All right. Last but not least, Dr. Barb Puder talking about food for thought. Welcome to the Supernatural Symposium, and you're probably wondering what's for lunch. If you're thinking about eating a brain, my answer to that is you should only eat a brain if you're a zombie. The rest of us that are humans, we might consider eating a brain, but one reason to not consider eating a brain is to think about what the brain is actually made of. And the brain is made of 100 billion neurons, an example of a neuron I have here. right? These neurons are able to communicate information to and from the brain. And there's a part of the neuron that actually makes electrical energy, and that's this piece here called the axon. Axons are covered in myelin, which are really just a big, fatty sheath of insulation. So you can imagine we've got 100 billion neurons in this brain. That means the brain is composed mostly of fat, which might tempt you to want to eat it, because that would be very savory. But one thing we need to think about is that the brain may possibly have another undead structure in it, which is called a prion. And prions can be very deadly if consumed. So we want to avoid eating brains at all costs just for our health and safety. If you're feeling sad because you want to eat something that looks like a brain but don't want to eat a brain because of the prions, pick a piece of food that looks like a brain. And my suggestion is to use cauliflower. When cut in a nice uh, view, you can actually see it looks like a little sagittal or mid view of the brain. To make it actually look authentic, you can add different colorings to your cauliflower. And one example would be to make this cauliflower pink. And the reason we think brains are pink is because brains are covered with blood vessels, which give it the pink appearance. In actuality, if you take the blood vessels off of the brain, the brain actually has a gray appearance. And that's because this part of the neuron is the cell body. It's not covered in fat, and so has a nice gray color to it. So if you really want to make a true color of the brain, you're going to take your cauliflower and dip it in a gray sauce. Making both of these pieces of cauliflower looking very similar to what a brain would look like, and actually very safe to eat. Enjoy the rest of your symposium, and bon appetit. <laughs> so that's it for us. Thank you very much for coming and participating today. Thank you to our exceptional faculty presenters, who have just done a great job and gone all in. And thank you to Media Services for all that help us.